the first part of this lecture, and tomorrow we'll talk about something different. But tonight we want to talk about, uh, you know, there's a lot of archaeological digs that are going on around the world, a lot of things that have been found, and it would be so hard for us to gather all of those together. We'd be here all night talking about it. Uh, there's things that have been found today that just reaffirm everything that's written in the Word of God. But I just wanted to share with you at this night eight important discoveries uh, that support the Word of God, support the Bible, support what we have today. Uh, before we get to that, I wanted to talk about what uh, biblical archaeology is. Uh, as you can see up here, biblical archaeology can be defined as the study of archaeological remains. So from regions, cultures, or periods in which biblical texts were formed. And we talk about three very important things when we talk about biblical archaeology. We talk about history, which is the study of events and human activities, and anthropology, which is the study of human societies and how cultures uh, react and how they form and the languages. You know, uh, the languages today are, are forming every day. If you were to read the King James, the 1611, the original King James, it'd be hard to understand today with the English that we have today. Uh, even in Spanish, Spanish continues to develop over, over time. And it also talks about linguistics and also modern biblical archaeology. It doesn't attempt to prove or disprove the Bible. You see, the Bible wasn't written so that you can open it and say, oh, this proves that God is real. The Bible doesn't do that. When you open the Bible, the Bible says that God is already God. Yes. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created. In other words, there's no doubt in the, in the writer's or in the reader's mind that when he opens the Bible that God is real. So, biblical archaeology doesn't attempt to prove or disprove this, but it reaffirms our faith. It says, rather, the archaeological study of the cultures in which the Bible was formed, or that are included in biblical narratives, can provide a better understanding of the materials and intellectual context of the biblical text. So, how do we find a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight? You know, today, you know, when you throw out your trash, the trash company comes, or you take it to the dump, and they take it to a specific place where all the trash is placed. And then sometimes they'll burn it or they'll let it uh, just disintegrate by itself. But in ancient times, when a city was destroyed or a building was destroyed, they didn't have a car to come and move all the trash. So what they would do is just even out the land and rebuild on top of it. And then somebody else would come in again and would destroy those buildings and then they'll rebuild on top of it again. So this is when an archaeologist comes and he begins to dig and he begins to see everything that we have in the different levels tells us the different ages in which we're digging. So when we talk about biblical archaeology, what we're going to attempt to do in, in this lecture for tonight is to see that there are eight discoveries. There's various ones, but these discoveries really help us to reaffirm the Word of God. So today as we begin to uh, learn about archaeology and learn about all these different discoveries, I just want you to just bring it all in and just see how God continues to reaffirm His Word. Now, why did we call this conference, uh, These Stones Cry Out? There's a narrative in the Bible that says that when Jesus is coming into the city, the disciples and many were screaming, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. So you can just imagine this. It says, peace in heaven, glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees there in the crowd said to Jesus, what did they say? Rabbi, rebuke your disciples. In other words, tell them to be quiet. Tell them to stop saying this. And Jesus turns to them and he says, I tell you, if, if these were silent, in other words, if we silence them, then these very stones, Cry out. And if you were to go to the Bible, the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible says, For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the woodwork respond. If we were to go into the Bible, and we go to the book of Psalms, chapter 8 and 9, we have there what many like to call today natural theology. In other words, what does that mean? That creation is telling us that God is real. Right? Especially today in our time that we live. 
So Jesus says, look, if you want me to tell them to be quiet, the stones are going to cry out. Nature is going to cry out. And we see that today in archaeology. In these archaeological finds, they are crying out today telling us that God is real. Now, why these eight discoveries? These eight discoveries are very important because I think they set a foundation for what we're going to be talking about in this conference. The first one. This is an inscription here, and you'll see it here. This inscription here. This is a piece of a stone we call the Tail Dan inscription. And we have a replica of this in the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. But this year, this archaeological find is in the Museum of Israel right now in Jerusalem. This archaeological discovery pertains to this guy here, King David. And this is one of the first archaeological finds that we have found that proves to us that there was a person by the name of David and that he was a king of Israel. Now, if that tells us, and I told these young people this, and I tell you this tonight, if this tells us that David was real and that he is a person in the Bible, then it proves to us that he also killed a giant with God's power. And if he killed the child with God's power, then it proves to us that what? God is real. Amen. Amen? So, one of the most well-known figures in the Bible, you know, previous skeptics love to refer to the familiar figure of King David, and they would say that he was a mythological figure. Oh, that's just laid up. That's just a story. How, how can a little man kill a big giant? That's impossible. They brought him close to what Hercules would be. But until this was found, this inscription in the city of Tel Dan in Israel, in northern Israel, it was found in 1993 by the archaeologist Gila Cook, and the writing on the inscription relates to an individual killed, to an individual killed Joram, and it says the son of the biblical character known as Ahab, king of Israel, but listen to what it says. This little writing here says he killed this individual from the house of David. When archaeologists found it, they said, wow, this is amazing what we found. Not only did they find this, but it says remembering the Hebrew expression. So there's an expression in Hebrew. But in Hebrew, their expression of when they say house of meant that it was a person or it expressed a dynasty. So the moment archaeologists find this inscription that says, the house of David, automatically they know that's from the dynasty of David. David, who was found in the Bible. So this confirms to us the existence of historical David and his kingdom. And the, mo and the monument is written in Aramaic. So remember, Aramaic was the language that Jesus spoke. So if you were to get the Bible today, the Bible was written in three major languages. You have Hebrew, you have Greek, and Aramaic. So they find this inscription, and it says here that he killed Jerom. He says, also known as the character of Ahab, king of Israel. And then he says, the king of the house of David. Now, at the same time, the inscription also confirms the account of 2 Kings. 2 Kings 8, 25 and 28, where the biblical character Jerom is referred to. So not only do we see him here, but we also see the house of David. When they found this, if they were going away. I told these young people at the museum, I said, this here proves that God is real. I said, so every little thing you see in this museum, I told them, you've got to pay attention. It's very important. This here confirms to us that God is real. Just this small rock here. So in other words, this is an example of the stones crying out us today. Now, the next one. The Nimrod tablet. We have when they're writing on tablets and we have here the second discovery, the Nimrod tablet. And it says here that the, the Assyrian archives are incredible discovery and amazing evidence of the book of Isaiah. The backdrop of much of the book of Isaiah is tremendous. 
Uh, it is, is a tremendous Assyrian threat under the Assyrian king, Tiglash Pilsar is his name, and who was extending his control over the Mesopotamian region. So we'll talk about that tomorrow. We'll talk about their reign and what they did and how we talk about this. But in simple words, what we're talking about here is the Assyrian army. The Assyrian army was a great army during the time when the kingdom of Israel was divided, when you had the north and the south. They were ruthless people to the point that they skinned people alive, they burned them alive. It was terrible. The Assyrians were terrible. As a result of the Assyrian threat, as it says here, the northern kingdom of Israel, listen to this, they allied with their neighboring, the Aryans, to foil the Assyrian threat. So just to give you a, some history here. The Assyrians are coming to attack the north, and instead of the northern kingdom going to God for help, they align themselves with another nation. What does that tell you about their confidence in God? They didn't have them. No. And what did God look, when he looked at it, he said, well, you don't want my help? All right. Go with somebody else. Now, it says here, they aligned with them for this threat and hoped that the southern kingdom of Judah would join them in their alliance. So not only them, but they said, we want, we want you guys to join up with us too in the south. But the king of Judah refused to join, and Isaiah chapter 7 details as a result, both the northern of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, and the Armenians were upset by this and decided to besiege Jerusalem to force Judah to join the alliance. Now, we have this discovery here, and in 2 Chronicles 28 and 2 Kings 16, it details to us how King Ahab decided to submit to the Assyrians. He said, I'm going to submit to them. And as a servant, asked for their help with regards to the Armenians on the other side of the northern kingdom of Israel surrounding Jerusalem. And he paid tribute of gold and silver and was paid to the Assyrians. All this is found in 2 Chronicles, what we're talking about. Now we know that this action was condemned by God. When we found this tablet, the Nimrod tablet, it explains to us in detail exactly what the Bible tells us was taking place. Mm -hmm. The Assyrians were really good at archiving things. Really good. Today, if you were to go to, to Iraq and those different areas, there's still areas that we cannot go into to discover things, but there's archives of, uh, for example, the Babylonians were really good at archiving everything they had. And we found many of those things today. And the Assyrians were exactly the same. The reason they did it was because they wanted to exalt themselves. But in this inscription here, it is explaining everything that is written in the book of 2 Chronicles. It explains everything that we talked about. Now, we have an excellent record of this tribute in the Assyrian archives dated 734 before Christ. Imagine. And it details... King Ahab's tribute to the Assyrian king in gold and silver. When archaeologists found this, they said the only record we have of what they're talking about here is in this thing called the Holy Bible. That's the only. So not only does this discovery help us to understand the Bible, but it also helps us to understand that the Bible is accurate historically. Even though it was written by many different right. people, it is historically accurate. Right. Because their dates are exactly the same dates as we find in the book of 2 Chronicles and 2 mm -hmm. Kings. Now, the Chronicle of Clephos III, turning to the description of the promised land in the Bible, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, the land, the land of Canaan is described as follows. Listen to this. It was the land of wheat and barley, of vines, of figs, of pomegranates, Olive oil, honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and will lack nothing. A land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper from the hills. Such a beautiful land that God had promised his people. And the Egyptians dominated the Canaan land at that time and several, for several centuries. And the region became an important center of trade and commerce. It was a very important place. But God, in his infinite wisdom, said, no, I want to give it to my people. I want to give it to them. And the Egyptians who dominated, as I said, they conquered, uh, before Israel conquered it, and they exploited the econ economic wealth of the Canaanite land to the fullest, 
left us various lists showing the good des destined for exports to Egypt from Canaan. And these lists contain statistic data and tribute extracted from Canaan. This is amazing what we have here. They're telling us exactly what it was. We'll see here. This shows us the rich prosperity of the Canaanite land as referred to in the Bible. Grains, oil, timber for building, copper, luxurious items, products, horses, exotic creatures among the products of Canaan. It was a rich, rich land. And as demonstrated by the transportation of economic goods in Egypt, the list of them here, we see a clear portrait of the blessings of Canaan in the Bible given to Israel. Now, let me talk about this one here. The chronicles of this king, Sennacherib, which some skeptics criticize the historical figure of David, but I want you to listen to this. We also had difficulty with this amazing evidence that it confirmed the existence of the king of Judah in the ancient Near East in the year 701 before Christ. When the Assyrians are attacking the south, after the northern kingdom is completely destroyed, all ten tribes are destroyed. We can read it in the Bible in 2 Kings 18 through 20 in Isaiah that the king Hezekiah never submitted to the Assyrians. But that was just a biblical record that we had. But they have found this cylinder, this Assyrian cylinder, and the reason we call it a cylinder, because if you were to get this today, it's very small. It's a very small artifact, and it's kind of like curved. And what they would do when they would write those archives, they would put them into the wall. They would have holes on the walls, and those, all the archives would go there. So you'd walk into the palace, and you have this big wall of archives in there. And when the archaeologists found this, they read an account, and the account said that the king of Judah, Hezekiah, never submitted to me. And that's the Assyrian army talking here. And when you go to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 18, verse 20, and you read in Isaiah, you'll notice that the same thing is happening in the Bible. That the same thing is happening there is the same thing that we're reading here. Now it says here, it details that after King Ahaz decided to submit to Assyria as a slave, which again was strongly condemned by the prophets for representing a lack of trust in God, Ahaz's son Hezekiah decided to declare independence from the nation. He said, I'm not going to do what everybody else is doing. I'm going to turn to God. That was the southern kingdom. This enraged the Assyrians, who were at that time under this king who then besieged Jerusalem. So he's going against Jerusalem. In 2 Kings 18, 13 to 14 details, the tribute that was paid to the Assyrians and in, is in recorded in the chronicles of the king here, and which were found in the year 1830. So what we're seeing here is... This cylinder there is found, and it is telling us everything that's going on according to the Assyrian histories. And when we get these Assyrian histories and we compare them with 2 Kings 18, 13 through 14, it's exactly the same. Not only exactly the same, historically accurate. What does that tell you? That what we have in front of us, the Bible, is historically accurate also. What we have here in front of us is a discovery in archaeology that once again proves to us that what the Bible is saying is true. Completely true. The Assyrian king is saying here, he's mad. He's, if you were to read this here, he's probably saying, I can't believe this guy, he didn't submit to me, I want everybody to know this in all the history of the world. Not knowing that indirectly he was being used by God to preserve this in order for us to get it today and then believe more in God. Right. Isn't that amazing? So, we have this here. Listen to what 2 Kings 18 through 13, chapter 18, verse 13 through 14. In the year, King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, listen to what it says. He came up against all the fortified cities of Judah. So he's coming against the cities of Judah. He's already destroyed all the cities around those areas. And he took them. So after he took those cities of Judah, what is left? Jerusalem is the only one left. The city of God. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria, Alakish, saying, listen to what he said, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. 
And the king of Assyria required Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. That's the biblical account that we have of what happened. There's history going on here. There's something that is happening there. The historical account of the Assyrian king, what we have here, the cylinder says, listen to what it says, regarding Hezekiah. Uh-oh. That's the same guy we have in the Bible. The Judean king. You say, wow. Hezekiah is in a cylinder of a secular historical empire, not in the Bible, confirming what we just read in the Bible. And it says, what it says about he did not submit to my yoke. He was mad. He was mad. He said, I besieged the strong cities, wall fortresses, and countless small villages, and I conquered them. But at the end, Hezekiah said, no, I'm not going to submit. He got him so mad that he had to write it down. This was his Facebook. <laughs> he wrote it down there. So we got, to, we got to see his Facebook profile today. Isn't it amazing that it confirms what we just read here? In 2 Kings. Man, that's amazing when you see that. Now, can you imagine the archaeologists when they found this? If they were not saved or they were atheists and they looked at it and said, Oh, there's no doubt then that God is real. Now, let's go to the other one. The Chronicles of Babylon. Now, Babylon, uh, modern day Iraq today. If you were to go there, there's so much ancient history there. It's amazing. Uh, everything that's being discovered in Iraq today. Now, the Chronicles of Babylon, with all the sources that have been discussed, we now move on to the Babylonian events. Remember when the Assyrians came, uh, uh, God helped the, the south of Egypt, this, I mean the south of Israel, the southern kingdom, but they failed God. They went again to following pagan gods, and then what happened? The Babylonians came and they took over, and they took them as slaves. In 2 Kings 24, 1 through 15, it describes the fall of Jerusalem in the hands of Babylon as a result of the sin of Israel, including the deportation of the current king of Jerusalem, Jehoiakim. So they came and they took him as slaves, and they took the king of the south. Can you imagine how, how Israel fell after being led by God? After being, you know, they're the people of God, and at that moment, they're put to shame. Can you imagine? It, it, this reminds me, when they're in Babylon, and they come to the, the Babylonians, and they say, sing us a song of Zion. Sing us something from Zion. And can you imagine their, their, their faces, the tears coming down their eyes, and and then they're, they're standing there by, by, the, by the rivers of Babylon and they say, how can we sing a song of Zion in a strange land? How can we? They knew they were no longer home. Can you imagine how sad it was for them to say this? All because they turned their back on God. So here we have the current king of Jerusalem is taken captive at the time and guess what happens? The Babylonians take over, and then the king comes and he says, I'm going to appoint my own king to my own liking. And this is what was found in this historical stone here. It's detailing when they took over, and the king of Babylon decides to put his own king. And the, this event is recorded in the Chronicles of Babylon. Listen to what this here. This is the translation of what we have here. On the second day of the month of Adar, he took the city and captured the king. He appointed a king of his own choice. And what we have here, and what they found here was exactly what is found in the Bible. Where the Babylonians that were real good at archiving their history, they archived it and they wrote on there, hey, we took over this area and we appointed the king that we wanted. And it goes exactly with what we have in the book of Chronicles. Once again, what are the stones doing? They're crying out. They're crying out to us. <coughs> the city of Tel Hazar. It's a great city. If you see this here, these fortified walls, this, this was once a huge city. 
Hazar is mentioned in the Bible in relation to the Israelite conquest of Canaan and its small kingdoms. Joshua took over this area. We find a description of this city of Hazar in chapter 11, verse 10. And guess what? They found the city. They found the city of Hazar now. And archaeologists have said this is the site of that city. And that city confirms what we have here where it says in verse 10, At that time Joshua turned back and captured Hazar and struck its king with the sword. So he came in and he took over. For Hazar formerly was, and this is very key to us here, the head of all those kingdoms. This was what we would call like the capital of Canaan at that time. And Joshua comes and they take over. And the book of Joshua relates, there were many Can Canaanite fortresses. In other words, very big walls in that city. And it details that formerly was the head of all those kingdoms. And when archaeologists got here, the str this strongly supports... The comment described in the book of Joshua formerly was the head of all those, uh, all those kingdoms. It says, modern archaeology estimates that the population of Hazard consisted of around 20,000 people. They came in there and, you know, it wasn't their power, it was God's power that was right. Making it the largest, most important city in Canaan. Excavations reveal impressive structures, temples, Dimensions, construction techniques, decorative elements of a beautiful complex. And in 2019, barely than 2,000 years ago, Egyptian statues the size of adult men were discovered mm. in this area. Mm. So it's believed that these were sent as gifts to the king of Hazar. So only those that were very important received these types of statues. And that details correctly mm -hmm. what verse 10 is telling us. That it was formerly the head of all the kingdoms. And we have that now in front of us. And they continue to dig in those areas today. The next one, the mess of steel. And I love this one here. And, and, and you'll love what we're talking about here. So the Museum of the Bible, we actually have a copy of this. And it is, it's a huge stone. It's very big. It's a big stone here. And it details that Mesa, the king of Moab, was a servant to the king of Israel, Ahab. <laughs> Listen to this. He was the king of he was a servant to the king of Israel, Ahab. Remember Ahab's wife? What was her name? Jezebel. Oh, she was a bad one, wasn't she? <laughs> now, <laughs> and regularly paid him tri tribute of livestock. So Ahab was like, hey, you're going to be my servant and you're going to pay me. So Mesa is always paying him, always paying him. And Ahab mentioned here is the same one, as we said, of the wicked queen Jezebel. And he was the son of the biblical character Omri, who was mentioned in 1 Kings 16. Now listen to what 2 Kings 3, 4, and 5 says. Now Mesa, king of Moab, raised sheep. And he had to pay the king of Israel a tribute of 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. That was a lot of money. But after Ahab died. So, so Mesa, the agreement is that he has to pay Ahab. But guess what? Ahab dies. So after I have that, the king of Moab rebelled. He said, nah, he's dead. I'm not going to pay nobody else nothing. Mm -hmm. That's the biblical account. As we can see, the king of Israel dominated the king of Moab and forced him to pay tribute. Now, surprisingly, the mess of steel was found in Jordan in the year 1868. This is crazy. Some of these stuff that we're talking about were found years ago, and some of us are barely hearing it for the first time. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. I looked at this and I said, why in the world have I never heard of this? Mm -hmm. The first time I read it. We really need to get the word out yes. to people today. Of right. Tell them, hey, yes. God is real. Right. Right. And the king of Moab complained about the oppression and expressed that he had been in the place during the time of Ahab's father Omri. So look, so we read the biblical account that he had to pay him. Ahab dies. And in this archaeological find, we have the following. I am Mesa. Look what he says. Son of Chemosh God, king of Moab, the Devonite. My father reigned over Moab for 30 years. And I have reigned after my father. And then he names Ahab's dad. Omri was king of where? Israel. Israel. And Mesa here says, 
Omri, the king of Israel, and he oppressed Moab for many days, for Chemosh was angry with his aggressions. His son succeeded him, who is Ahab. And he also said, I will oppress Moab. So again, he writes on his Facebook, and he's mad. And he's saying, hey, I'm not going to pay Ahab. I already paid his daddy. I'm not going to, this, this, you know, he has to forgive me. This is archived outside of the scriptures of what we have. And it proves to us again that what? That Israel was real. And if Israel was real, and if it's written in the Bible, then it takes us back to what? That God is real. It's just, it, again, the stones continue to cry out to us. The message still supports the account of 2 Kings the third, uh, 2 Kings chapter 3 of the oppression of Moab and confirms the existence of the biblical character Omri. And scholars believe that Omri was one of the most important kings of Israel who was the father of Ahab. And we see him directly mentioned by the name by name in the mess of steel. This is the first time we see this in archaeological discoveries that they have the name of a king of Israel. You know, the one we saw, the, the Tel Dan just said the house or uh, the house of David. So it didn't mention him directly, but we know it's talking about David, his dynasty. But here he mentions his name. And this deal dates back to the year 860 B.C., which is exactly historically accurate with what we're reading in the book of Second Chronicles. It's amazing. It's the longest inscription from the Iron Age found in Palestine. Wow. And we'll finish with the last one here. The letters of the Kish. Now, this is part of the letters. These are extremely, they're like this small. They're like three little ones. Three little small letters. And the Babylonian capture of Jerusalem was sent, which sent many Jews into exile, is an event that's recorded in both the Bible and in the Babylonian Chronicles. You say, what? Not just the Bible talks about Israel being captive and taken into captivity, but also Babylon has archived it for us. And we see here that Jeremiah, in the book of Jeremiah regarding the city, was mentioned in the context of Babylonian campaigns against Jerusalem, and the letters of the Kish stand out as evidence for the book of Jeremiah. So we have evidence here. As the Babylonian campaigns advanced, the book of Jeremiah mentions the town of Lachish and Azekah. So, the Babylonians are attacking these cities here. And I want you to picture this in your mind. They're attacking. There's stuff going on everywhere. And the Babylonians were real good at what they did. And the discovery of this supports the following. Jeremiah 34, 6 and 7 says, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and all his army and all the kingdoms of the earth under his dominion and all the peoples were fighting against Jerusalem and all of the cities. So it's a big attack against the cities. The word came and the Lord says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am giving this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. Can you imagine the judgment that had fallen upon the people of God. <coughs> the Lachish letters here are pottery fragments that we have found were discovered in 1935 by the archaeologist James Leslie Starkey and date back to exactly 590 before Christ. Again, falls back exactly and accurately to the biblical account of Jeremiah 34, 6 and 7. The time of Jeremiah. So they were found in a small room near the outer gate of the city. And what we have here, again, is these fragments that are being found and continue to be found today that are uh, showing us and proving to us that the word of God is real. Now this was found in a small room on the outer gate of the city of Lachish beneath a layer of charcoal and ashes. So what they do is when they dig up these different rocks, they begin to separate them and they put them into different buckets and then they'll go by them one by one, looking at each one, making sure that there's pottery or there's something there that is informative. Now, the letter describes a correspondence. So this was a letter. This was a text message they're sending each other during this time. Between a commander of the army stationed in the city of Lachish and a man named Hosea. 
who was in charge of the garrison station in one of the towns between Lachish and Jerusalem. So they're sending each other letters. And listen to what letter number four says. <laughs> and let my Lord know that we are watching for the signal fires from Lachish. So he said, hey, let him know we're watching. When that fire comes up, we know what we're going to do. Because according to all the signals that my Lord has given, because we cannot see Hezekiah, the city. They couldn't see the city. So he's sending him a letter. He's saying, hey, we are in where? Lachish. And Jeremiah <coughs> mentions the city of Lachish here. And then he says that we cannot see the other city that is mentioned in the Bible. So we have one side. God is telling them, hey, they're coming. And I'm going to let them come and take this place over. And then you have the other side, the Babylonians, saying, hey, we're waiting for the signal to come. Then we're going to take over. And all in the same place and at the same time. Both reported accurately of what we have today. Once again, what is this telling us? All these documentations are telling us that what you and I have in front of us is real. Yes. The Word of God is real. The discovery of this in reference to the town of Zakai and the skeptics who claim that the Bible is all mythology, this piece of pottery is an additional piece, listen to this, that they cannot resist. There's no way that you could go around this. It supports the existence of the town mentioned in the book of Jeremiah. Furthermore, scholars suppose that in its time, this letter marked the beginning of the transformation of Zechariah and Lachish with, re with regard to their final conquest. Listen to what it says here by Babylon. In letter four, we are watching for the signal fire. So in other words, it was as soon as that comes up, we'll take over. And the Bible says that they did. Babylon came and they took over that area. So these are just eight of these discoveries. And I want you to remember that arche these archaeological discoveries support the Bible all along. Because we have a what? An amazing God. So we're going to end here tonight with this, with these eight discoveries.